I'm delighted to be here and am really honored and humbled to be uh, almost coming full circle. I was an active member of the PhD project and I'm so grateful to KPMG for your leadership in recognizing and understanding the importance of uh, the way in which organizations can help make a difference in the lives of students and to have had the foresight 20 years ago to, um, to, to work with colleges and universities to help identify an opportunity to really bring forth role models, to your point, Jose, uh, that would allow more people to, to inspire and compel more young people to get an advanced degree and choose an academic path and earn a PhD. I am pleased to be a part of that legacy and very honored to be here today. Um, my goal today, or what I was instructed to do, is this, is this the clicker? Okay was to share with you a little bit about understanding diversity. This is work that is near and dear to my heart, for which I will explain momentarily. But uh, as, as was mentioned in the introduction, I am very happy to be reunited at the Emory Business School, Goizueta, Goizueta Business School at Emory University. Uh, you can see the, the statistics there. I won't take the time to read through them with you. But uh, I wanted to share what compelled me to return to Emory. I was on the faculty there about 14 years ago for a period of three years, left to go to the University of Virginia for personal reasons, and uh, was honored to get the call to consider coming back as the dean, and, and even more honored to have been selected. But I want to tell you a little bit about why I am pleased to be at Emory. And in large part, it's primarily because of the people, and it's because of the legacy that exists within the leadership of the school. So as Jose was mentioning, our school is named for uh, Mr. Roberto Gozueta, who was a chairman and CEO of Coca-Cola for a period of about 14 years, during which he took the organization from a value of 40 billion to 140 billion. That is a remarkable feat. And he did it by the sheer power of his leadership and commitment to making a difference for the people of the Coca-Cola organization. He was a very principled man and, uh, as, as, as Jose mentioned, was someone who left Cuba during the revolution uh, with basically $10 in his pocket. He grew through the ranks of the Coca-Cola company when he moved to Atlanta, Georgia from Cuba and eventually served as chairman and CEO. And what people found so compelling about his leadership and what they identified in him very early on was his commitment to a number of key principles, such as excellence, such as integrity, all of the things that matter here at KPMG, but also his commitment to diversity. He was a Cuban and eventually a Cuban-American, and he was very, very committed to ensuring that the Coca-Cola company would represent a diverse environment and acknowledged the importance that diversity played not only in the organization but also in the world. That is a value that I hold and it's a value that is very clear throughout the Gwazeta Business School. And when I think about the opportunity that I had to come back here as the dean, one of the most compelling factors was knowing that I was coming into an environment that cared deeply and was committed to matters of diversity and inclusion. <clears throat> I won't go through this slide because that was all presented in the, uh, in the introduction, but I will share with you, oh, I'm sorry, I need to go back. I will share with you a little bit about my journey around diversity and inclusion, because I'd like for you to understand why I'm the one standing here before you today to have this conversation. Uh, my own history is one that is perhaps a little unusual, particularly for the time. I am an African American. I am born of, of two parents who were uh, born in the, in the Midwest, African-American mother and father who divorced very early in my life. And after their divorce, they had separate lives for some period of time and then both eventually remarried. My mother and I moved to St. Louis and ultimately to Texas where I spent the vast majority of my life and at which point my mother remarried. And she remarried someone who was not only white but also Jewish. And this was in the 1980s in a very small rural town in uh, Texas, just north of Dallas. And it was a time period for which interracial marriages and interfaith marriages and Jewish people were not an active part, were not, it, it was not something that was done at that period in time in that particular part of the world. And so life for me 
was one of um, challenge in some respects because I was seen as an anomaly. I didn't really fit in the white population. I didn't really fit in the African American population. Back then we were, we were black. So I didn't really fit with the black population. And I found myself struggling with my own identity and trying to make sense of the world that I was living. And if you thought that I had any reprieve when I, in the summers when I'd go visit my father, um, it was the same thing all over again because my father married someone who was white and Irish Catholic in a very small town in the upper peninsula of Michigan where in a 500 mile radius in the summers, he and I were the only black people in, in the region. So wherever I went, I found myself in a situation that for me to some extent seemed normal because that was the life that I had, but to everyone else, people's reactions to me and to my family dynamic was not so normal. And as I matured and left home and went to college and graduate school, I, I had to come to terms with who I was and what my identity was. And I found myself pursuing career paths that were largely dominated by men. So now I had the race thing going on and the gender dynamic going on. And so I was always very curious about my experiences and I was very observant about other people's experiences uh, with respect to diversity. I'd seen my mother make choices that were different from the norm in order so that she could advance in her career. I'd seen my father make choices that were different from the norm so that he could achieve what he wanted to achieve. So in graduate school, I, I chose to study diversity in the workplace and that became my my uh, interest and passion as a scholar for many years. And fast forward, I'm teaching one year at Tulane University and I'm teaching a group of uh, evening MBA students. So these are people who are working full time and coming to school to earn their degree in the evening. And most of them, this was in New Orleans, most of them worked in the oil industry. And it so happened that one year, uh, a very prominent oil company had a massive class action discrimination lawsuit. And my class got hijacked because all the many of whom worked for this company, they all wanted to talk about that situation. And that helped me recognize that to some extent, what I was, what I found as a curiosity at an individual level, I looked, I was concerned about, interested in my own personal matters of diversity. When I looked at an organizational context and recognized the challenge, in the early and mid 90s that companies were having understanding how to manage what was becoming a more and more diverse environment, that led me to a different avenue of research which on the screen here, um, it's not on the screen. <laughs> there you go. Uh, which helped me understand that for, in some cases, diversity can be problematic and when not handled appropriately, it can lead to some challenging situations. Uh, that helped me parlay my research career into understanding issues of crisis and understanding who were the crisis leaders in corporate America. I was less concerned with um, the actual nature of the crisis and more interested in understanding what differentiates people who can lead companies through really challenging and turmoil times. I have also, as a woman, and particularly for many years in a business school context where the vast majority of the faculty that I interacted with, every administrator that I interacted with, and the vast majority of the students tend to be, the majority of which are men, and I find myself as a woman in that context, I wanted to understand more about the context of gender in the workplace, and so that led to my work in, in women in leadership. And then finally, um, I am happily married for 15 years, been with my now husband for a total of 20 years, and we've never, lived in the same house on a full-time basis in all of that time. We met in an airport, which probably should have been a clue early on that we would <laughs> be traveling to see one another. Um, and I tell you that because that has also informed a research agenda, which is, again, a, a context or a matter of diversity, and that is understanding how long-distance relationships, and I refer to it as the commute, how that works, and what are the implications for organizations as they're trying to manage an increasing a population of employees who have life experiences and who have life situations that are not the typical situation anymore. So for me, all of this, my whole life experience has been around matters of diversity. I've wanted to pursue that and I've been fortunate enough in every, uh, every environment that I've been to explore that and feel relatively prepared to talk with you about my understanding of diversity in hopes that it will 
help in what you're trying to achieve here at KPMG. So what I have on the board, and it may sound familiar because Scott brilliantly described much of what I will share with you, and that is when we think about what it is that we want to create, what is it that we're trying to achieve when we talk about matters of diversity and inclusion, and at the end result, there, is, there are key performance results for the organization that we're striving for. But what are the factors that lead to those performance results? And I've outlined here several that I want to spend a moment with you talking about. The first is the context, the environment within, within which your organization exists matters in terms of achieving, achieving results. So I told you a little bit about my background. I grew up in a very small town uh, where the context was a segregated one. And that for the small businesses, there were no large companies there, but for the small businesses, that context mattered in terms of where they drew their employee population from. Likewise, in your organization, in any, any organization, the context within which uh, you exist, your environment matters with respect to uh, what's possible in terms of how you achieve and approach diversity. But it's not only about the context, it's also about the leadership. And it is abundantly clear to me, and has been with my now almost 20 year engagement with KPMG, that the leadership of this organization cares deeply about matters of diversity and inclusion. So the values, the principles, the philosophy of the leadership can help guide an organization towards achieving overall business results, but also helping to understand how diversity and inclusion helps us generate those business results. So context and leadership. Then there's also the systems. What do we design into an organization that help us achieve the results that we want? There are a number of design factors, a number of systems that exist. There are technology systems, for example. There are operational systems. Uh, but the one that I think, the, the set of systems that are most, most uh, aligned with diversity and human resources practices are those such as how we think about how we bring people into the organization. How do we attract them to the organization? What are our recruiting processes? And do we present and engage in recruitment efforts that will make this organization attractive to a variety of people? How do we go through the process of hiring people into the organization? How do we onboard or socialize them into the organization so that we set them up for success at the beginning? What are the reward mechanisms, and how are those structured? Are those structured in a way that promotes equity and fairness, and are they merit-based? What about the feedback system that exists in an organization? Many of you might be familiar with the research, and you may have experienced this firsthand in another organization, of course, that um, women and minorities tend not to get the most rich feedback in their annual performance management conversations. There are a variety of reasons for that, but the challenge is when that happens, you have people operating on one set of assumptions about their performance, and you have managers and supervisors potentially operating on another set of assumptions about their performance. And, and that disconnect can be problematic. So how we give feedback and the extent to which we give accurate and, and necessary feedback is a key system that can drive diversity results or not. So context matters, leadership matters, and the systems that are designed into the organization matters. All of those only matter, though, when there is an alignment. If you have systems that are striving to achieve one thing, and you have leadership who values something else, and you have a context that is pushing you in a different direction, when you have that kind of misalignment, then you're not able to uh, build the momentum in order to achieve that you're, driving, that, that you're striving for. So the alignment across context, leadership, and the various systems are critical for helping you not necessarily achieve the results just yet, we're going to get there, but for helping you achieve a culture. Okay? And this is where there's considerable overlap in what Scott was describing and what I have here. The culture is what drives the performance results. Some of you may be familiar with the phrase, culture eats strategy for breakfast. That's because you can have the best strategies in the world, but if you don't have a culture of people, and, and organizations are the people, if you don't have a culture of people who are moving in the same direction, who are energized by the same thing, then you're never going to be able to achieve the, the objectives of the strategy. 
So culture matters. When I talk about culture, when there's alignment across context, leadership, and systems, what you end up getting is attracting people from a variety of regions, a variety of organizations, a variety of schools, a variety of places to come into, from a variety of backgrounds, to come into your organization. Okay? So that's a matter of bringing the diversity into the organization because of the alignment that exists and everything that's preceding how the culture is developed. When you have diverse people in the organization, that also means you have diverse experiences. And when you have diverse experiences, you begin to think differently about how to solve the organization's problems, about how to be creative, about how to make decisions, about what decisions, about what questions to even ask. Okay? So diverse people have diverse experiences. Those diverse experiences lead to diversity in their thinking. And that diversity in their thinking leads to perspectives that matter. But why do those perspectives matter? They matter largely because when you create diverse, diverse cultures, you have the opportunity for innovation. And every organization now is striving to differentiate itself. Because to your point, it's not just about having the leadership or about the people. It's about adding that an extra layer of value to differentiate KPMG for every, from every other organization in your industry and beyond. And the way you have successfully chosen to do that and continue to do that is through managing and embracing and encouraging diverse environments within your organization. Now, all of that seems simple. On paper, we kind of know what to do. But the reality is the vast majority of companies either don't get that or struggle somewhere along that path. And I want to take just a moment to help us understand what is it that happens that might challenge our organizations anywhere in the world from being able to successfully create the cultures that drive innovation. And there are a number of answers to that. I'm going to share just one. And one of those answers is largely around what happens with the way that our brains work. Our brains are wonderful things. They take in a lot of information. They synthesize a lot of information. They help us in decision making. Our brains work very efficiently. But because they work so efficiently, we oftentimes miss information. We don't see everything, or we conglomerate information in such a way that we lose the value of the uniqueness of some parts of the information. Okay. So as a long-term professor, it's hard for me to be speaking in, in front of any audience and not have a quiz. <laughs> so I have a quiz. It's called the F-test. All I want you to do is when I show you the sentence, I'm going to give you seven seconds. And all you have to do is read the sentence and count the number of Fs that you see appear. OK? Are you ready? And I have a timer down here, so I'll know exactly when seven seconds is up. OK, here we go. Count the number of Fs in the sentence. How many Fs did you see? Four, six, th three, five, seven. Anyone see more than one? <laughs> Were we looking at the same sentence? Maybe? Let's try this again, OK? Although, because you've already seen the sentence once, I'm only going to give you six seconds this time. Are you ready? Here we go. Uh-oh. <laughs> now you have the answers. So how many did you see that second time? Eight. You'll see here, there are actually eight. Someone tell me, what did you miss the first time? Of. Almost unanimously when I do this test, people skip over the word of which it's a preposition. I can understand that. Uh, 
But what I find remarkable is that 50% of the word is the answer you're looking for. <laughs> so I don't quite understand how that's the one that you skip over. No, um, but yes, it is true. Some people have said that because phonetically the F and of doesn't sound like the F sound, and so they don't recognize it when they're doing their, their mental read of the word. Um, but I, I present this test to you because it is an illustration of how our brain works. It describes exactly what I just said earlier, that our brain, it's a sentence, I don't know if you actually read the sentence or you, you just counted, it's, a, it's not an easy sentence to understand. They're words that we don't necessarily use in our everyday vernacular. Uh, but in order, our brain was trying to do us a favor because I timed you. I said you have seven seconds and then eventually six seconds. And the brain says, oh, I've got to go into super speed mode. And there's a lot of data. There's a lot of information here. There are a lot of letters here. So what can I do quickly to understand the sentence without really having to read the sentence? So that's our brain's way of helping us. But what did we miss in that efficiency? We missed the, the, the word of, right? And it appears at least twice, three times. So my question for you no, not that question. I'm sorry, can you go back? One more. Advance one more, please. No, other day. My question for you is, who or what are the ofs in your organization? Okay. By that, what I mean is, what are the ways in which the context and the systems operate within KPMG that make it easy for us to miss opportunities of the value that people can contribute into the organization? Okay. I don't expect an answer, but I do hope that this elicits some thought and reflection in your organization. How is the company structured? Is the company structured? I shouldn't make assumptions because you might not be be doing this, and I suspect by much of um, the value that you've provided to diversity and inclusion already, this may not be significant as much here as I find it to be in other organizations. But clearly, recognizing that our brain is working to help us manage information efficiently, but in so doing, we can lose the value of the uniqueness in people and in ideas. So when I talk about diversity, one opportunity we have is to recognize and slow our brains down and become more aware of all of the opportunities that exist with the vast variety of diverse people, diverse ideas, diverse talents in your organization. So as I wrap up, there are key things that I'd like for you to think about and, and, and to take away from this. One is, you know, we all, value being comfortable. And that comfort may make it more challenging to really reap the benefits of diversity. So what I invite all of us to do, and I include myself in this, is to pay attention and see the diversity that exists. And by that, I don't just mean the various obvious, the various obvious factors of diversity, the race and gender, because that tends to be more central. But what are the other forms of diversity that exist within the organization that we don't pay attention to? And how can we be more observant and actually see those aspects of diversity? How do we become comfortable with acknowledging that diversity is good, that difference is good? There was a time period when we would say, I don't see color. I don't see race. I don't see gender. And to me, that's actually quite sad, because when you see those things that are different, it gives you an opportunity to learn something new. So seeing difference, acknowledging difference, and engaging with those differences, forcing ourselves out of the comfort zone to be with people and be with ideas and be with groups uh, and departments that are familiar to us, when we force ourselves to step out of that, we expand our horizons in ways that we could never have imagined before. So use the differences that exist in all of its wonderful facets as a means to learn. And when, when we're learning, here's what I'd like for you to think about. It's not just learning people for what we can imagine on the, in, in the superficial aspects of learning, but it's really getting to know people and what they care about. 
I have up here four things, values, assumptions, beliefs, and expectations. The acronym for that is VABES. Our goal should be to understand what people's VABES are. What is it that they value? And how do those values make a positive difference in the organization? What are the fundamental beliefs and assumptions that people have? And how do we take those fundamental beliefs and assumptions that any individual has to help us create value in the organization? And what are the expectations that people bring when they step into work every day? And how do we use those expectations to help create a difference, a positive difference in the organization? So for me, this is the essence of diversity and inclusion. And when we get to know people and get to know their ideas and get to know their values, assumptions, and beliefs and expectations at a very core level, we have not only enriched ourselves, but we have also enriched KPMG. Thank you very much.